There are three topics concerning words that I want to cover uh, in the course of this uh, family weekend. Uh, the first theme this evening are powerful words, powerful words. The second theme tomorrow will be harmful words. And then to end on a p- very positive note on the Lord's Day morning, I hope to speak about beneficial or helpful words. So that's what we're hoping to cover in the course of this weekend. Beginning tonight with powerful words. That's why it's read from this chapter, especially if there's one verse I'd like you to take away with you this evening. It's that verse 21 here of Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 21, God's word says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit the tongue has the power of life and death. What an important role, you'll agree, words play in our lives, don't they? Uh, in the course of this weekend, probably, uh, we're talking about plentiful words in a little while. In the course of this weekend, I, I estimate, my computer tells me, I'll be speaking to you over 9,000 words. So I hope that's not too many. For you to take in, but I'll speak in about over 9,000 words in the course of uh, the three talks. But we, w- 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 words are such an important part of all our lives. And the Bible has a lot to say about the right use of words and the wrong use of words. But I wonder, how often do you and I really think about the quality of our speech, the quality of of our words. I wonder how often we carefully think about whether the words that we're speaking are honouring or dishonouring to the Lord our God, about whether our words are in general helpful to others or could they be harmful to others. In my experience as a pastor, now over 30 years in the ministry, I can testify I can very much testify to the potential that words have for the doing of great good or the doing of great evil. I've seen a tremendous amount of comfort and joy brought to the people of God by the wise use of words, by godly speech. Yes, I have. Very thankful to have seen that. On the other hand, I've also had the experience of seeing great hurt, great hurt and even great disharmony and division caused by the use of ungodly speech. So I think it's very important, it's of the utmost importance that we all give careful thought to the use of our words. And to help you do that, say I'm going to have three messages on this topic and I hope that God will use these messages uh, to to help you to use your words more wisely and especially to avoid the sins which we can so easily be committing by the use of foolish words. So the first message this evening is entitled Powerful Words and I could have turned to quite a number of passages of scripture but the one that I'm Emphasizing is Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. That the tongue is said here even to have the power of death or of life. That's very powerful, isn't it? You'd agree if something has the power of death or of life, that's a very powerful thing. And we're told there the tongue has this power. Before I look at the main theme of powerful words, there are two things I want to say by way of introduction, two preliminary things. They also begin with letter P. And the first one is, what a privilege words are. What a privilege it is to be able to speak and communicate by words. The ability to communicate by the use of words is that, isn't that one thing that sets us above the animal creation. Children, you may have heard this rhyme or this statement. Cows can moo, 
you know that. Dogs can bark. And they bark far too much, in my opinion. But anyway, cows can moo. Dogs can bark. Lions can roar. That's impressive. Birds can sing. That's beautiful. And where we live in Donegal, out in the middle of nowhere, it's wonderful in the morning or indeed in the evening time to hear the birds singing. So cows can moo, dogs can bark, lions can roar, birds can sing, but only humans can speak words. Well, I know there's such a thing as a parrot. You know, the parrot can be taught a few words. <laughs> there was even one down, in the, I think, in the Letter Kenny, one of the shops in Letter Kenny, and it's still there, but uh, it used to say a few words to me when I went into the shop. But in general, <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Only human beings have been blessed with the ability to speak and communicate with words. Now, sadly, of course, there are people in our world who can't speak at all. Uh, people who've been born without the ability to speak. And that's a very hard thing for them. Despite the use of sign language that we have nowadays and other facilities, it's a very hard thing for those who are deprived of speech. My younger brother, now deceased, George, and some of you have known here, he died a few years ago, because of a trauma at his birth, he couldn't speak clearly at all. He got, he got speech therapy, but he couldn't speak clearly at all. And as he grew older, that was a tremendous source of pain and frustration and depression to him. He was so frustrated, he couldn't make himself understood a lot of the time, except perhaps to his immediate family, and even times we struggled. And of course, as we approach the end of our earthly lives, most of us will actually lose the ability to speak in a coherent way and our loved ones will find that hard to deal with. But ordinarily, ordinarily, it's true, isn't it? As human beings, we enjoy the tremendous privilege of speech and we should be making the very best use of it. For as Christians, don't we acknowledge the ability to use words is a gift. It's a gift from God. It's a divine gift. It isn't an evolutionary trait that has somehow or other developed over millions of years. We were hearing about the eye earlier. But likewise, the ability to utter words isn't something that's just developed by accident. It's a gift that God has given to mankind to enable us to communicate with one another and they just speak to him as well in prayer and in praise. Think of what the Lord said to Moses long ago. Exodus chapter 4 verse 11 when Moses was sort of saying I'm not very eloquent I can't speak to Pharaoh and the Lord said this then the Lord said to him who has made man's mouth who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind is it not I the Lord it's the Lord who gives us the ability to speak indeed this is one of the evidences that Jesus was the true Messiah the divine Messiah because he could impart the wonderful blessing of speech to those who were mute. In Isaiah chapter 35 verse 6, Isaiah 35 verse 6, it was prophesied concerning the Messiah who was to come. In these words, Then shall the lame leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And when we go to the Gospels, don't we see that happening in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in his healing ministry? Here are two examples. Matthew chapter 9, 32 and 33. You come across this episode. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute. Mute means can't speak. Who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the man spoke and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything that this seen in Israel. That Jesus could impart the gift of speech to the mute. Or move forward in the same gospel, Matthew chapter nine chapter to Matthew chapter fifteen, verses thirty and thirty one. And you'll find it being recorded there of the ministry of Jesus, quote, and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame and the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. So the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. The ability to give speech, the gift of speech, marked Jesus out as divine, the divine Messiah. 
Speech is a precious gift from God for which we should be truly thankful. Truly thankful. Think indeed of the joy we derive from good conversation. The joy of good conversation. Someone has summed it up this way. Sweet discourse, or that's conversation. Sweet discourse makes for short days and nights. Uh, you've had this experience, Monsieur. Doesn't the time fly whenever you're involved in interesting conversation? And suddenly you realize... I'm behind schedule. You've been involved in a good conversation with a friend, an interesting conversation. On the other hand, on the other hand, how burdensome it can be if you have no one to talk to. No one to talk to. I can recall very clearly a lovely summer's day when I happened to be walking along a road in Bangor, County Down. Somebody very wonderful comes from Bangor and County Down, so I uh, must have been visiting the in-laws. Uh, I was, I was up a lovely summer's day. I was walking down toward the beach valley home, looking, for, looking forward to enjoying a lovely walk. But standing outside a place that provided sheltered accommodation for the elderly was an elderly woman. I had never met her before. And she was standing there and she looked at me and I just said a, a polite hello to her, as you would do. I just said hello, expecting to carry on my walk without any delay but she started speaking to me about this that and the other the everything and anything she kept on speaking to me I, several times i sort of tried to step forward but she kept on speaking to me it was quite some time before i resumed my walk and i realized afterwards of course that this lady must have been very lonely longing for some conversation so much so, she was so eager to talk to someone who was a complete stranger to her. And there are many people round about us like that. Far more than we might realise. I suspect here in this pretty large town, we'd almost call it a city now, wouldn't one? Uh, this very large town of Letterkenny. I'm sure because of its very size, there are <coughs> lonely, isolated people longing to be talked to. So appreciate, first of all, this evening, how very privileged we are to be able to avail of words, to be able to communicate our joys, our hopes, our sorrows, our fears, our needs to our fellow human beings. On the second preliminary point, not only how privileged it is to have words, how plentiful words are, how plentiful words are. Speaking of words, is something we do every day. The moment we get up in the morning till we go to bed at night, and sometimes we even talk in our sleep, some of us. Uh, they're constantly on our lips, aren't they? Moment by moment, day by day. And, and what excitement there is, I'm sure you can relate to this, those who have children here today. What excitement that there is whenever we hear a child utter his or her first words. We tend to remember that, don't we? I remember my mother telling me that one of my first words must have been a phrase was cat in the pesh, which translated means there's a cat in the wardrobe, cat in the press. We called that wardrobe a press in Donegal, maybe still do that. And apparently one of the first things that came out was, was cat in the pesh. And there probably was a cat in the pesh in the old farmhouse in Donegal. Uh, and th my mother remembered that. She used to say it to me. Those were, your, were some of the first words you ever spoke. And then we go on speaking, don't we? We go on speaking. What a, what, what, a, what a multitude of words flow out of our mouths throughout the course of our earthly lives. Now, I'm going to come to some dangerous ground here, particularly if, if the ladies present. James Dobson, the family counsellor, once gave an estimate of the average number of words spoken by men and women in the course of an average day. <laughs> I can't remember the exact figures, but I believe he more or less said that women tended to speak on average twice as many words as men. Now that has been challenged by psychologists and they claim he wasn't right. Uh, you can draw whatever conclusion you wish from this, but taking it in a positive way, if, if, if Dobson was right, maybe it shows us women are generally more sociable than men. And uh, that can be a good thing. That is usually a good thing. Not always, but it's a good thing to be sociable. 
However, some, some men in the past haven't been too appreciative of the plentiful words of woman. It's said that the poet John Milton refused to allow his daughters to learn a foreign language. It's because he said this, one tongue is enough for any woman. There's also an old proverbial saying, three women make a market. Don't think I need too many. If there are three of them, there'll be a lot of noise and they'll make a market. On the other hand, I'm thinking of plentiful words, some people, and this is often said to be more true of men, rightly or wrongly, some people are far too silent, aren't they? Their words are not very plentiful at all. The man of whom the complaint might be justifiably uttered, you can't get a word out of him. You can't get a word out of him. He comes home and he won't answer you. You can't get a word out of him. Not a word. And how about when it comes to the gospel? I wonder how plentiful our words are. John Stott, a great Anglican theologian, wrote a famous book with the title, Our Guilty Silence. Our Guilty Silence in which he critiqued our failure to speak as much as we should about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we may speak plentifully about many other things, but we don't speak half often enough about our Christian faith and our, our Christian hope and about the good news of the gospel. I wonder, can I challenge you to think about this, how plentiful are your words in regard to the good news of the gospel? Could they be all too rare and all too infrequent outside of a church setting anyway and I wonder are our words sometimes not plentiful enough in the presence of evil when confronted with evil aren't we sometimes too afraid to speak out about what is good and true whereas those who want to promote that which is evil and false they're very outspoken seemingly how often we hear voices in the media proclaiming abortion is a good thing we often hear that how seldom we seem to hear voices speaking in defence of the unborn. And of course the media increasingly deny us such an opportunity. But whenever the opportunity does arise, are we ready to speak out in defence of the precious sanctity of every human life? We can too, all too easily fall into a guilty silence. However, when it comes to the Bible actually, the main danger highlight is that our words can be too plentiful. Our words can be too plentiful. Listen to the statement of Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Here's a different chapter in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. It says this, When words are many, sin or transgression is not absent. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Did you hear the first part? Whenever words are many, sin is not absent or transgression is not lacking. When your words are very plentiful, it's very likely transgression will not be absent. Consider the guidance given to us in James chapter 1 verse 19. James 1 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Quick to hear, quick to listen, slow to speak. Is that true of you and me? Or could it be we're far too quick to speak, far too slow to listen? Have you not at times had cause to think to yourself, Oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Maybe to a child in a moment of frustration, to a friend when there's been some misunderstanding, in some tense situation you blurted out something, and later you said, oh, I wish I'd kept quiet. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't the right time. I shouldn't have said it. Who among us doesn't have such regrets? Thoughtless, careless words that should not have been spoken. The Puritan Thomas Manton could claim, I think, with some justification, quote, most of a man's sins are in his words. Most of a man's sins are are in his words and you sometimes hear the advice don't you it's good to talk it's good to talk and of course there's great value in talking over things not allowing problems to fester but actually it's not always good to talk not always good to talk 
Sometimes it's much better, much wiser, much more honouring to God to remain silent, to hold one's tongue. There's a lot of truth in the observation. I don't think it's scientifically accurate or whatever, but there's a lot of truth in the observation. We have been given two ears and but one tongue to the end that we should listen far more than we speak. So those are two preliminary matters relevant to the use of words. How privileged we are to be able to utter words. How plentiful our words can be. But now it's time to deal with the main issue arising from our text here in Proverbs 18.21. How powerful words are. We're told that they're so powerful they even have the power of death and life. Of course, there are limitations on the power of words, aren't there? There's a proverbial saying that goes something like this. Fine words butter no parsnips. You heard that's an old saying. Fine words, you've got to go and butter the parsnips. Not just say, it would be nice to have buttered parsnips. But somebody's got to actually do it. Speaking fine words about it aren't going to give you lovely buttered parsnips. I don't think it would appeal to me that much. But anyway... Some must have been some people like them, or sometimes it is said critically about a particular person. He's all talk and no action. He's all talk and no action. He's all these ideas, but he never gets around to implementing any of them. That's a real danger to be avoided. And sometimes can't we be? Lost for words. Lost for words. That, that words aren't always adequate to capture or describe an extraordinary experience that's just so overwhelming. You can't find the words, whether that be an experience of tremendous joy or, or an experience of terrible sorrow. You can't find the words. So yes, words are limited in a number of ways. It's good to be aware of that. It's especially highlighted in regard to helping the needy. The words of 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 this morning. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deeds and in truth. It's no good saying, well, oh, it's a pity that person's poor. Just keep on saying it and never do anything to help them. Actions speak louder than words, it has been said. Well, having said all of that, Let's come back to the main point. Words are very powerful. We mustn't underestimate their power. It can even be seen from the concluding words of verse 21. Look at the second line there of verse 21 of Proverbs 18. Those who love the tongue will eat its fruit or eat its fruits. The, now, what does that mean? It's maybe not totally clear. The imagery seems to relate to the scenario of a person cultivating a garden so the stomach will be full. So they may have good food to nourish him and keep himself alive. But if, as it, if, as it were, his words were like the sowing of po poisonous seeds, then this will have the worst consequences for himself. He'll have to eat the fruit that is deadly. And in fact, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the powerful potential of words for bringing about good or evil. Look back, for instance, uh, earlier on in the same chapter. Look back at verses 6 and 7. A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating or a fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul makes me think of uh, Mark mentioned earlier that I know a bit of Irish I do, I don't claim to be fluent but I particularly like Irish proverbs I think some of them are very insightful and tying in with that statement in verse 6, a fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating is this Irish proverb which goes like this, this minic Avrishin bail dinya achroon. Translate means, tis often a person's mouth breaks his nose. <laughs> you get the picture. Somebody's mouthing off, they're getting involved in a verbal altercation, and before you know it, because what comes out of their mouth, they get a punch in the nose. Or look at an earlier statement in the book of Proverbs, which should bring home to us just how powerful words can be. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. Proverbs 12 and verse 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, 
but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Reckless words pierce like, like a sword. Your words have the power to cut people to pieces. But on the other hand, they have the power and potential to bring healing. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way in relation to the ungodly use of words. He writes, Tongues are more terrible instruments than can be made with hammer and anvils, and the evil which they inflict cuts, cuts deeper and spreads wider. Maybe you've had something said to you at some point in your life that was really, really unfair, really, really crushing. And despite all your best efforts, you struggle to get out of your mind. It comes back maybe to haunt you uh, and, and trouble you. Those words just come back again and again and again and you struggle to forget them because they've cut into your psyche and cut into your emotions so, so deeply. And you see, young people here especially, this is relevant to you. Nowadays, such piercing words can even be communicated by a text message via the internet. Parents need to be very aware of how words communicate in such ways can hurt and can bully. It's becoming far too common. We need to be very wary of the great harm that the, that the communication of such words can cause to little children and even to those who are more mature. On the other hand, what power to impart hope and healing are words that are carefully and graciously chosen. As, many, as well as many verses in the book of Proverbs, there are other places in the Bible where we are alerted to how powerful words can be. And I'm going to turn now to James for a moment. It's only time now to consider what that passage in James chapter 3 has to tell us about the powerful impact of our words. Recall how James points out the tongue is only, it's only a very small organ really in the body, but it has great Power. He says it's only a small little organ, the tongue, but it has great power. And he, he, to, to illustrate this, he draws a number of comparisons. He draws the comparison between the tongue and the bit in the mouth of a horse. Well, I think I've only ever once been on a horse. And I never want to be on one again. <laughs> it was in County Wexford on holiday. And you're with me, Carl Hink, and uh, we decided we'd go pony trekking. You know what I think you do in holiday you wouldn't normally do? I thought we'd go pony trekking. And uh, Carl was quite fearful looking. So she got a wee tiny pony. No problem. I had put on the big manly show, so, so I didn't seem nervous at all. They gave me this huge, big, black beast of a thing. And they set me on it. And I was sure that this horse would run away with me. And I'd end up over a ditch dead. However, they did show me how to control it. And I didn't manage to control it. Mind you, there's a person alongside me as well. <laughs> it's amazing how uh, that horse was really strong. It was really powerful. And yet you could control it with a small bit in its mouth. The bit and with a bridle. Another comparison used here, and I have no experience of this, that maybe some of you have, that a small rudder of a ship can control a great ship. It's a small little thing, and yet it can determine the direction of the great ship. So we must understand the power of the tongue. Just because it's a really small thing, it doesn't mean it isn't powerful. It can be very powerful. And then James continues his lesson about the tongue by using two pictures, at least two. There are more, I think, but at least two pictures which illustrate how powerful the tongue can be. And let me just point these pictures out to you. The first of these is a spark of fire. A spark of fire which could actually, James says, burn down a great forest. It can burn down a great forest. A tiny begins with a tiny spark, but then it spreads and it spreads and it spreads, and a great forest is burned to the ground. You've heard reports in recent years, I'm sure, of the wild fires that devastated so much of the countryside in places such as Portugal or Australia. Or think historically what happened to the great city of London. Maybe the children have learned about this in history. The great city of London in the year 1666. Well, it wasn't as big as it is now, but it was still a great city then. Most of it was then destroyed by a raging fire. And it stopped. The fire began with a spark in a baker's shop. And it, most of the city was burnt to the ground. The tongue then is compared to a fire. And you can appreciate how powerful a fire can be. There's another picture used as well in James chapter 3 to bring this home to us that though the tongue is, is relatively small, it's very powerful. 
verse 8 of that chapter, James teaches us it's full of deadly poison. Deadly poison. The picture here seems to be that of a serpent or a poisonous snake. The tongue is so powerful, it can have the same fatal impact that being bitten by a poisonous snake can have upon a person. I'm so glad and so pleased I live in Ireland for one particular reason, not because of the weather. I do like the weather, uh, or I do like the warm weather and the hot weather. I'm not so keen on the Irish weather. Get, I love getting away to the continent. But I'm so thankful to live in this country because, as you know, St. Patrick banished all the snakes. <laughs> well, that's the story anyway. But we don't have any poisonous snakes. Uh, and several times I've had nightmares about poisonous snakes. I'm really afraid of the whole thought of anywhere near a poisonous snake. I don't think I really want to go to Australia. There are too many poisonous snakes there. And it would take a lot to persuade me to go to certain parts of Africa because there, there are poisonous snakes there. I really do fear poisonous snakes. And yet one should be very wary of the tongue. It can be full of poisonous poison. Poison. Keep in mind, dear brothers and sisters, your words can have such power, the power of a raging fire or the power of a deadly poison, the power indeed of death or of life. I'll draw it all together. How privileged we are to be able to communicate with one another. It is a privilege to be able to communicate with God in prayer. How plentiful our words are, and therefore we do need to keep them in check but especially remember this evening from the word of God how powerful your words can be. And in closing, let me seek to apply this in three ways. As we recognize from the word of God how powerful our words be can be for good or for ill, here are three things we need to bear in mind. First of all, as words are so powerful, let's realize we will be held accountable for them we'll be held accountable for them jesus makes this point very solemnly in matthew chapter 12 36 and 37 but i tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken for by your words you you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned for every careless word and if words are so powerful we can do a lot of harm with them We need to remember we'll be held accountable for how we use our words. And then secondly, as we realize how powerful our words, shouldn't that make us prayerful about them? I wonder how much you ever pray about asking the Lord to guide you in your words, especially maybe if you're going into a tricky situation, in a family situation, a work situation, or maybe even a church situation. Do Do you actually ask the Lord to guide you in your words? We should do that. We should do that far more than we, than we do. Psalm 19 and verse 14 will be singing at the end. The psalmist says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Or Psalm 141 verse 3, the prayer. 141 verse 3, Psalm 141 verse 3. Set a guard at my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Set a guard. Keep watch over the door of my lips. But of course it goes even deeper than that. How vital, the third thing, not only how we, remember we're to be held accountable, remember we need to be prayerful, but how vital then for us to know the transforming grace of Jesus Christ in our hearts. For you realise, I'm sure it's obvious, the the tongue is not an independent organ. It doesn't act independently. What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. It's what's in the heart comes out of our mouths. And so in order for us to speak in ways that are going to be gracious and godly and honouring to God, we need to have the grace of God working in our hearts through Jesus Christ. The more we become like him, the more gracious, the more godly, the more wise will be our words. The more life-giving they will become. So please do take away, especially this evening, uh, the words simply here of Proverbs chapter 18, our main verse, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Amen. And uh, 